Welcome to the National Quiz Choice Online News and uh, welcome to, uh, everyone. And uh, I, like, I wish to welcome uh, Chef Jack Tila on my online show. And uh, he's one of, you know, one of the best uh, chefs around uh, here in the United States uh, and also in Asia as well. He's been on, on TV around the world. Uh, Chef uh, Jack Tila, you know, uh, mind if I call you Jack Tila? Yeah, please, please don't call me Chef. We're not in the kitchen. <clears throat> only call me Chef in the kitchen, please. <laughs> okay. Just call me Jet, Robin. Just Jet only. No need for Tila either. Just Jet. Okay. You know, uh, it is said that you spent most of your childhood learning cooking from your get, uh, from your grandmother. Uh, now, how did your obsession came about uh, for the love of cooking and why? Or is it because you were forced into it? <clears throat> you know, that is a, it's a combination of both. So I come from a food family. My parents had, my grandparents had a cafe when they came from um, China into Thailand. My dad's mom had a Chinese cafe in Bangkok. And uh, my, my dad's side is Hainanese. So my grandma would have a Hainanese cafe so she had seven boys. They all worked in the restaurant. When my parents moved to the States in the 60s, we opened a market in a restaurant. They opened a restaurant uh, when I was, gosh, about four years old. So um, my obsession started because I was forced into working at the restaurant. And my grandma, the way we communicated was through cooking. As soon as I could stand on a chair, I would sit there and peel vegetables or I would stir things and I would watch her and she would teach me. So she started teaching me at an absolute very young age. As soon as I could stand, I started learning how to cook. That's a long-winded answer, but there's your answer. <laughs> no, I do, I do welcome long answers. Um, so how was life like when you entered uh, Le Coudon Bleu, uh, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, because you spent quite a fair bit in your grandma's kitchen and um, and you went on to Le Coudon Bleu to learn more about cooking. And while, we were, while you were at Le Coudon Bleu, what kind of challenges did you face? You know, Was there any cultural conflicts uh, uh, with your mentors between French and Asian cuisine? I'm sure that you know, they, they find it hard to understand why an Asian guy would want to learn French. You know, that's a great question. In all the years, in 20 years of being interviewed, this is the first time Someone asked me a great question like that that's relevant. So, you know, the, the challenge of going to Le Cordon Bleu is um, coming from the Asian kitchen, woks and steamers and fryers, we know nothing about, it prepares you for very little of what to expect from the French kitchen because their set of rules and understanding of food is a different, a little different than ours. The only, the only thing that we have in common is because I've cooked Asian for so long. We understand how things cook, how you cut things. But outside of that, I had to start all over in my career. And I had a lot of conflict with my instructors because they were so formalized. You know, a lot of Asian cooking is so by feel. But the number one takeaway I got from culinary school, or two takeaways, is I learned how to formally cook French food. And then I learned that it's important to write down things that we learn from our Asian masters because our Asian masters don't give us enough. They say, hey, about this much of uh, ginger or about this much of garlic. And I learned, I took that and I learned how to quantify that. And that's how we can, and that's how now I can teach, you know, people ahead of me. So it was, it was a, it was a benefit. It, it, I needed it to become who I am today. Huh. You know, was there any favorite uh, moment that you have while you were at Le Cordon Bleu? I mean, the, the moments with your mentors. Well, uh, you know, I had one mentor. I had one instructor that I, I did not get along with. He was an Asian instructor. He felt like he knew everything, even though he's never worked at an Asian restaurant. And um, <clears throat> I was also interning at the Los Angeles Times at that time. And... And, I, and at, at 23, I was just a baby, I wrote a cover story. So he walked into the kitchen that night uh, for, for class, and he had this giant newspaper, and he, he really hated me, that guy. And he said, what? I can't believe you're in the front page of the newspaper of the food section. You know, this guy's about 40-something years old, and he never really made it. So that was, that was justice. That was a nice little moment of 
see, you don't know everything. We're always learning. So that was a great moment for me. Outside of that, um, you know, culinary school is necessary for those who want to really excel. Um, but you know, that was one of my that was one of my most memorable moments for, of culinary school. And what 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 are the three takeaways learning takeaways when you left? Three learning takeaways of French culinary school is it's good to know all the techniques from stocks to sauces to mother sauces to technique to garmage. Uh, you know, it really teaches you that you can break down a kitchen into formal stations and run a brigade, right? So that's one takeaway. Number two takeaway is um, the French were amazing because they wrote things down. And Asians need to write things down more. Um, and um, I can go off on a tangent, but I, I, I'll come back to that. And the third takeaway I would say is um, it teaches you rules. It's like the military. And when you run your kitchen like a military, you get very efficient and you get consistent. So those are my three takeaways. But can I go on a little bit about my, my second takeaway? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so the second takeaway, we have to write things down as Asians because this generation under me and the generation under them, they're going to forget all of our recipes because Asian masters are not writing or formalizing. We're going to lose our, our cuisine. I mean, look at French cuisine. They're prospering because hundreds of years of perpetuating knowledge. I think a lot of Asians have to do that. We have to follow their lead. Wow. That would be an amazing takeaway. Now, uh, no. How did you land yourself writing for Times uh, magazine and you got yourself into journalism actually uh, after you graduated and, and, and why, did you, why did you choose that path? Uh, you know, I've written, like you said, I've written for about 20 years and all in for a chef, not, not bad, I've written maybe 50 to 80 pieces in, in, my, in my 15 year career. Um, I think more than, as much as I'm a chef, I'm also a student and I'm also a teacher. So this ties directly back to my last point. I really believe that uh, we have to perpetuate knowledge. And the only accurate way to do that is to write it down. And also writing it down keeps me from forgetting it. So I can, I, this is the only way. I can write one article and teach thousands of people about Chinese New Year. And and it's an effective tool. And then this piece, because of the internet now, when you tie internet into journalism, these things live forever. So someday in 50 years, when I'm old and retired, some kid will type Google search Chinese New Year or Google search my recipes, Tom Yam Pad Thai, Asian cooking, and I'll still exist. And writing is a way for chefs to live forever. If they're good writers. If they're bad writers, then you might be forgotten. So. No. Do you see yourself as a, uh, a, a Thai chef or Asian chef? You know, what is culture, uh, uh, no, uh, culture now today, even for the United States? That's a, again, Robin, great questions. You've done your homework. Uh, my hat's off to you as a, as a journalist and an interviewer. Um, I am a, an Asian American chef, right? Meaning I am of Asian descent born in America. If I was in Singapore or Thailand, I would be labeled as, uh, I would be defined differently. But because there are very, very few voices in this country that speak, I have to speak for all of us. So I, I focused my studies, Thai Chinese because that's my culture. Japanese because I was very passionate about learning all the kitchens of Japan, the, the, the raw kitchen, the steam kitchen, the fry kitchen. Um, and because of my journeys and travels, um, I've learned other cultures. So I can cook a little bit of Singapore. I need to learn Singapore better. That's what I really need to learn. But um, I consider myself an Asian chef because I'm an Asian American. I have to speak for all of these cultures. Yeah, if the, again, I'm giving you long answers. If you want shorter answers, just tell me, okay? No problem. No problem. I enjoy the long answers, actually. And so do my viewers. Um, my viewers also like to know, um, how did you how did you actually land yourself as a celebrity celebrity chef on television? Uh, you know how did that happen? Uh, first time I was on TV, Food Network just started 
coming out, and I think about 98, 1998, and it sounds like a long time ago because all these young kids that are cooking were just barely born. Um, I, I cooked for one of the producers, one of the big time producers for food television very early, and that was just luck. Or it was right place, right time. And from that one appearance, I saw food television as a tool to be a very efficient tool to um, teach cooking. And if you think about most cooking shows is about teaching, right? You want to learn something when you watch a show. It's not, it, this is before reality drama TV. Um, so I, I told myself two things. I have to go to culinary school because I know Asian, but I need to know how to speak in the French language and the American language of cooking. And then I learned you have to become a personality. Because if you, if, if I talk like this on TV, people get very bored and I don't have any personality. But if I teach myself, if I get some media training and I know how to engage people through the little lens, then um, people get excited. So that food TV has changed the world. I think you can agree and most of us agree. Television and food coming together has changed the game in the last 10 years. So it was important for me to be a celebrity, quote unquote, chef to use this media to teach even more people. Huh. Now, you are different from most chefs that I observe watching your show over the years. Uh, why did you choose to explain uh, the definition of the ingredients? That's one thing I, I, I've seen. Why do, you, why do you choose to do that? Why, why, why will you not do it without it? Well, I do it because this is how I learn, right? Most people, even Asian people, sometimes can't cook Asian food. So if, if, I, if I tell you this is a pencil, it, it's not enough. If I tell you there's a piece of lead in the pencil that makes the mark because it breaks off every time you write with it, it cements that piece of knowledge. And I think it makes you a more effective cook, right? I'm arming you with the tools to be, to be better and more efficient and stronger. So. I think it's important to me to break down ingredients because you have to learn how they play together. Um, a, a really delicious dish is like, is like a quartet or a symphony. It's many different pieces coming together to make music, right? And if I need to teach you what, you know, what, uh, um, what a guitar does and why you need a bass guitar, why you need drums for rhythm, right? Why you need piano for melody, and how they play together. So in, in, that's why I teach that way, because if I teach you the pieces, the, it, the entire composition becomes better. Now, I have another question that's from one of my viewers. They ask, have you ever cooked some dishes uh, that were found out of taste during the television show? I know that uh, you know when you cook those dishes and you, you demonstrate that how, t how tasty it was, but have you ever tasted something that's out of taste? I know that it's hard to... <laughs> No, no, I, I'm fully, I, I full disclosure, I'm not going to lie. Uh, when I was shooting Chasing the M, the one dish that I was not happy about, that I tasted on camera and I had to say, you know, darn it, I have to sell this, but I really walked away unhappy. Uh, believe it or not, was uh, the Singapore show. <laughs> I, I can't master chili crab to save my life, right? I, I, I can't for some reason. I can cook so many things in the world, but I can't make chili crab amazing and I can't make laksa amazing yet. So um, tell your viewers I need help. Send me their mom's recipes, send me their mom's uh, YouTube video so I can learn from them. So that's, that's one show that I walked away after 24 episodes and um, said I can't, I can't do Singapore right. It's killing me. <laughs> okay. Now, you opened a cafe over at Google Headquarters. Uh, how's it going so far? And do you have any plans to open more cafes uh, uh, as such in the near future? Uh, yeah, so um, Google was amazing. And um, the thing about media is, uh, the, the dirty truth is, I opened Google, you know, seven years ago, right? Mm -hmm. and, and then I've opened, uh, I did Chasing the Yum, the TV show, about five, six years ago. Even though you see it every day, you think it's real every day, but... Um, so all those are going very well. The next project is something called uh, Chef Jet Modern Asian Kitchen. And I'll send you photos. But these are cafes in universities, 
business institutions like Google and hospitals. So it's a big fast food, but more pan Asian. So that's my next. We have four already. We're going to open more. So is it is it some kind of like a a food court concept? Yeah, it's um you know America the most famous Asian food court concept right now is probably Panda Express. I think people know that name, um, but it's like that. It's a fast food concept, and there's always Pan Asian. So there's Thai, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, and there's always a vegan option, and there's always gluten free options um, oh. because that's the diet now of America. <laughs> now you are a fan of social networks like Facebook and.、Um... You, would you open consider opening one、uh, in the near future with Facebook? No, just kidding. <laughs> no, one of the chefs at Facebook. So the, don't you're kidding, but we never know. We never know. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Facebook's、uh, founder, his wife is Asian, so you never know. They have great Asian chefs. If you come to the states, we'll go to Facebook together. <laughs> <laughs> Now,、um, tell me something. You did start a food home delivery service called Schwanz.、Um, what does it mean? Because most of my viewers would like to know because they're traveling to the United States up on and off for holidays or for business, and they came across this、uh, delivery service called Schwanz. What does, what does Schwanz mean? And how did you、uh, promote it? You know,、uh, did you have a strategy? Because it's a、yeah. delivery service. It's a great question. Again, if I get too long, let me know. I'll shorten no, my answers. No, it's okay.、Please、okay, take your time. No problem. Schwann's is America's largest and oldest frozen food company. Period. They're like the kings. So、um, they have a division called home service. Right. In most of America is actually rural America. I mean, most of the world knows the big cities like San Francisco, New York, Los Angeles, Chicago. But most of America lives 30 minutes to one hour away from a large grocery store. So Schwann's Home Service Division has 3,000 large frozen trucks that go out to millions of homes and deliver fresh frozen food. And they were shooting Top Chef, I think season five in Las Vegas. And one of the quick fire challenges is. If you win the quick fire, you get a frozen food meal from Schwann's made in your name. I told them they were shooting in my hotel at Win Las Vegas at that time, and I said, "You know, your Asian food isn't that great. I have to be honest with you. Let me make great Asian food for you, and if you like it, we'll partner. If you don't like it, then、uh, don't we walk away? I'll buy you lunch from my restaurant, no problem." So it really started that simply. I flew to Minnesota. I made some Asian dishes for them. And we have the only Asian line partnership with Schwann's Home Service. Period. There is no other chef in the world that has a partnership with them. So we sell.、Um, you know,、uh, it's a it's a privately held company, so I can't tell you exact numbers. But we sell units in the millions every year with them. So Asian people visiting from Asia, if you're staying here for university, if you're staying here for an extended work time, you can go to schwanz.com/chefjet. Order my meals, and they'll deliver them. And in eight, ten minutes, you can cook them on the skillet, and you can have some of my food. Well, folks, there you hear. You heard from the man himself. You could order your schwans、uh, while you are back in the states, and、uh, for Singaporeans as well. And please forgive Jack Tilla for not able to get you your chili crabs. <laughs> now,、um, you know, besides besides、uh, you know the issue. With Schwann's,、um, you you also were working with、uh, Wazuzu, a Pan Asian bistro with uh, Win uh, Las Vegas for for a while.、Um, was there one favorite signature dish that you've taken with you that you can't live without? <laughs> you know,、oh, that's that's a really good one.、Uh, you know, I created my version of drunken noodles at right、uh, because. You know, Chinese we have like hao fun, right? And we have dry style、um, chao fun or hao fun. And Thai we have something called pad ki mao, which is like a basil spicy hao fun dish. So while I was in Vegas, I was trying to create a unique flavor, and that's why I married these two Thai Chinese flavors to make my version of drunken noodles. And it's I think it's become the most famous thing I'm known for、uh, in the four years that I was in Vegas. It was on. 
you know, Jada's best thing I ever ate. It's been on TV all the time. It's been written up a lot. So that's the dish I created that I will take with me forever. So Jada can't live without your favorite dish, huh? Wow. Yeah, it's her favorite noodle dish she's ever eaten. And she said that on TV, <laughs> which is pretty great. And, you know, um, so do you do you do that for, do you ever cook at home? Uh, yeah, you know, uh, you are in my home kitchen right now. This yeah. is my home. Welcome to my home. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, this I cook here. We cook a lot. My wife and I, uh, you know, because we had a new baby, uh, we, 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 I cook and we, we keep food here. So I, we probably cook about two, three times a week. Wow. Now, now you move uh, Bistronomics. I know you used to have Bistronomics uh, to your new restaurant concept store uh, right now, which is known as Charleston. Uh, why do you choose to call Charleston? Uh, you want the dirty truth, the really fun truth? Um, I needed to get away from Asian restaurants for a while. I needed to take a break after being in Vegas. So we wanted to open a very fun gastro pub, a very fun bar that has really good food, right? But the, the show is the alcohol. We bought this space and it had really cool, um, you know, prohibition southern uh, de like details and design. We wanted to stay in the design. So, you know, my business partners and I said, it doesn't have to be Jet Tila anything. It doesn't have to be Asian. What name ties to the style of this restaurant? And that's why we called it the Charleston. When you walk in there, you think about the 1920s and the dance, the Charleston. You think about prohibition. So it's like a speakeasy. And that's why we called it the Charleston. And I think that you do have uh, great acts, uh, the jazz and, and blues and whatnot uh, during the week. And folks, please don't forget to drop by at the Charleston where Jet Tila resides. Uh, yeah, and I always let me know first. Tweet, tweet me uh, at Jet Tila. Let me know you're coming, especially if you're from Asia. And there's a rumor on the street, Robin, that I'm giving you this for the first drop, okay? If you don't tell anyone, Andrew's, uh, this guy named Andrew Zimmern is coming to shoot his show with me at Charleston this Sunday. So. Oh, wow. So, and folks, don't forget that. This Sunday, if you're in town in the United States, please drop by at Charleston and you might get a autograph with Zimmer and Jack Taylor. Now, uh, Jack, you know, finally, uh, no, it's not finally yet, yet, but do you believe in destiny? And uh, Is this the life that you strongly believe that you're born to be a great chef? And if you do fail, do you have a plan B? Wow. That's a, again, Robin, of 20 years of being interviewed, probably some of the best, if not the best, top three interviews in my life here. Um, God, do I believe in destiny? My wife absolutely believes in destiny. She says, I was meant to be here right now. I'm a little more cynical. I think it's been a lot of luck with skill and time, right? I think that's what, that's what it is. It's been the right place, right time the right skill set, and a little bit of luck. So uh, I don't know how to do anything else in life. And, and if you asked me 10 years ago, if I failed, what would I do? I would have said, I'll go become a police officer. I'll go chase criminals, shoot guns, drive cars really fast, live on adrenaline. But uh, I think I've insulated my life now to, this is all I ever can do in my life. And um, I'm one of the fortunate chefs that can make a living doing it, and and um, but I'm very lucky. I do what I love every single day. There's you know so so no, there's nothing else. If I fail, I'm going to walk off into the sunset like Cain from Kung Fu and just wander the earth. If I fail, this is it. Is one chance. No, but uh, but let's say, but do you believe in reinventing Plan A? If you if you. If you don't have a plan B, do you believe in reinventing yourself? Yeah, I believe a good chef has to create a brand out of themselves. So instead of when you fail, you reinvent yourself, you have to, you have to put your eggs in a few different baskets as a chef in this modern era of cuisine, right? You cannot just be a chef who cooks in a restaurant. You have to have a B plan, a C plan, all concurrently, not after you fail, because when you fail in this business, you are forgotten, 
that fast in about one minute. So as so I have branded myself in in frozen food. I have branded myself in restaurants. I have branded myself in, uh, you know, fine dining Asian large scale. I've branded myself in retail. So this is why we will try to not fail is because <laughs> trying to leverage all of our contacts. So, uh, so I think we've, we're almost to the point where I can say we've already succeeded. I, I'm almost, I can think about paying off my, my daughter's college education soon. So, so that's a, I think that's the learning point from that, that great question. Now, how do you manage to find uh, love? That's one of my viewers' question because you you are married now, you have a baby, and and how did you have the ability to cu to cultivate work, work life balance? Uh, and because and, and do you actually cook at home after work? Because I you know I, I'm I'm pretty sure that most chefs usually what I heard is that they have their wives cook for them. Uh, so what's, what's your take? This is in Asia. Wives don't cook in America. Uh, you know, we're, we're not we're not lucky like that. Asian wives still cook in the home. My wife's listening right now, probably thinking, "What a jerk!" But uh, American wives don't cook, man. Get that in your head right now. So, all you Asian men in Asia trying to come over here, find an American wife, prepare for them not to cook for you, okay? Because that's not going to happen. Um, did you hear that? Without my wife's right here saying, "What did she say?" I'll I'm like, the question, you missed it, honey, is how did I manage to find a work-love balance? And uh, the truth is this, Robin, uh, I expected never to find love or to have children. This is the truth, because I gave myself to this career wholly and completely. I dedicated uh, from 28 to 36, why is that like 18 years, expecting to be successful and never to be married or you're having children because it takes that kind of dedication and then um two years ago i found myself finally in a place where i was financially secure and i, I met the woman that i met five years prior in a cooking class i met my wife teaching cooking classes in los angeles six years ago almost maybe seven years ago and we fell in love and i decided i have to i want to I want to go down that path. I found a woman that I've, I love so much that I want to get married. I want to have kids. So that's why I left the restaurants full time. So I don't think most chefs, it's very difficult to have a work-love balance if you're working in a kitchen 100 hours a week. So that's another reason chefs should find another outlet. Um, you know, try to diversify. I got it. I'm so sorry these are long answers, Robin. I apologize. No, no, no. We welcome long answers. We want that. I like a ghost. You see that little, you see the, the glimmer over there? Um, anyway. <laughs> now, now, one of my uh, viewers now is asking me, is, and uh, that is, what is your strategy uh, to succeed as a chef, uh, you know, and what are the three keys in promoting yourself and your concept restaurant? Um, that's a good question. Wow, man. Asia's got the interviews and the best viewers. Uh, Okay, before I begin, what's the first question is, what's the strategy, right? Yes, the, <clears throat> what's the strategy, to, uh, what's the strategy uh, to succeed as a chef yourself? Strategy is, um, I, look at, I look at two mentors. You're going to laugh, but I look at two mentors. Wolfgang Puck is a mentor. He's an amazing chef that built an empire through diversity. Restaurants, retail, frozen foods, strategic partnerships. My second celebrity mentor is Ryan Seacrest. Do you know Ryan Seacrest? He does the radio show in the morning. He does American Idol TV shows at night. He does the news show, and he produces all the Kardashian reality shows. The man doesn't sleep. But the two takeaways from those two mentors is diversity, is to diversify the brand. Um, and the strategy is build great teams. In each company that you build, you have to have people that you can trust that are amazing. Spend the money for great teams, and all that will come back in, in tenfold. So okay. those are the those are the Tila strategies. Oh, could you repeat our three strategies? Uh, the three strategies again, because we kind of like lost in between. Oh no problem. 
my back or is it still tough? Okay. Is that better? Uh, yeah. Okay, so um, diversify, like stretch your brand out and have many outlets and, you know, in business. Hi, welcome to uh, Jack Tila. Uh, and uh, now we're now into part two of our segment. Um, what, what was the, your three, three strategies? All right, let me, how's this on my back? Audio is yeah. okay? Okay, yeah, good. Yeah, that's okay. All right, yeah, three strategies are really uh, diversify, right? Try to maximize your revenue streams. Um, if you have a restaurant, try to do other things, right? Try to consult, try to have a retail outlet, try to have, so diversification is one. Hire amazing teams. That's second. Don't be cheap in trying to put together your teams because they are your representation when, you, when you're not there, when they're running your companies, right? And then um, three is continue to learn, right? Never think you know everything. That is the biggest downfall of chefs nowadays. They come out of school, they're 20 something and they think they know everything. And um, so those are my threes. Oh, wow. Now that's a million dollar resume. Now, the, uh, what are the three most important ingredients? Uh, this is one of the questions that my uh, viewers ask is that what, what is the three most important ingredients that you must have in your kitchen? That, wow, you that's live, that, that you can't live without. That's a good one, man. Uh, for my kitchen, right? My kitchen is uh, a fish sauce for me. Uh, my kitchen is um, uh, chili because I have to be broad because I only have three ingredients. And um, uh, my kitchen uh, is, uh, I, I wish I had two instead of three. I actually had four. Oh. I want to say garlic and I want to say sugar. Because I love the balance of those flavors together. Could you elaborate on those four flavors? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, like it, like like you know the TV show, chasing the yum. I really believe in that. I really believe that everything has to have hot, sour, salty, sweet. I think life is complete when you have all four of those flavors. And we, I believe that in most Asian, I think in most Asian flavors, that's why we love, people love Asian food, is because it's a little hot, a little sour, a little salty, a little sweet. And so, now, are you a fan of organic food? Uh, this is another question uh, one of my viewers is asking. And what is your perception of genetic uh, modified foods? You know, I think that we all are consuming GMOs because of the evolution of, you know, large-scale food production, right? I think that we all want to consume less, okay? I think awareness is the first step in changing GMOs. And I think the, the world is aware now. So I think we need to try to consume less GMOs, I think we should be more organic, but let's take steps, baby steps, okay? Uh, let's not completely, you know, uh, rebel against the food culture as it is. Because of these technological advances, we can feed the earth right now. But let's figure out what's good for us, what's bad for us, and then let's find the middle ground, right? I mean, without GMOs, uh, we wouldn't be where we are today in terms of advancement, but let's figure out what's what's the good, what's the bad, and then let's let's take it one by one, and let's not create mass hysteria by a few articles written by you know non professionals. Okay, so I do like Michael Pollan's books. I do like his you know you know the uh, Omnivore's Dilemma in Defense of Food. So let's let's read the the right people and then formulate our opinions and then let's have discussions and let's change. That's my opinion. Oh, and is there one ingredient that you hate and you will never use for your cooking? <laughs> I hate ripe papaya. I hate, I love green papaya. I love papaya. But ripe papaya to me smells like stinky feet, right? And, and you know how some people hate cilantro or love cilantro? I can't handle ripe papaya. <laughs> well, did you did you have a bad experience with over ripe papaya? 
I think I have the enzyme. You know, some people have the, that enzyme that makes papaya smell bad to you, right? And this, and not, not Asian papaya, not the small one, the really long Mexican papaya. Yeah, so um, to me, ripe papaya smells bad. I won't cook with it ever, ever, ever. Have you ever... The have you ever tried durians in the United States? Do they have durians in the United States? Yeah, all the Asian companies, we import fresh durian. I love durian, personally. Do you eat durian? Oh, yeah, I do. I do. Oh, wow. Okay. I'm surprised. Yeah. I, I, you, know, you know, Thai people, we eat durian a little less ripe than uh, Chinese or Hong Kong or uh, Vietnam. Thai people, we eat it uh, not so soft. And I like it like that. Oh, and how do you tell? How can you tell that if if the durian is not right yet? Three ways. I'm a durian expert, by the way. Uh, my family was the first family to import durian by con air container. Okay, the first way is when you take the durian fruit. You know the the top that connects to the tree that they cut off the tree. If that little stem uh, part falls off, that means the durian's ready. The second way is to tap the durian fruit with a a, a piece of wood. And the more hollow it sounds, the more ripe it is. And the third way is when you turn the durian over at the butt side, if it's open but naturally, that's very ripe. So those are the three ways you can tell durian fruit ripeness. I just impressed you, I can tell. Not bad for an American kid, huh? <laughs> not bad, not bad at all. Uh, and so now speaking, of, because, you know, Singapore, and as well as Southeast Asia is a durian paradise. So everybody loves durians. You know, no one could deny that. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a food paradise too. And I think your wife and yourself will probably enjoy it in your next yeah. visit. And now, my, one of my viewers uh, like to ask you, uh, and that is, what is the future of food? Um, how do you manage inflation when it comes, uh, you know, because of the increasing food prices, especially you're running your concept restaurants and, and so forth, uh, you know, uh, how do you handle that? Well, hmm. the, uh, are we talking about how do you, what is the future of food and what are we talking about the economics of food costs? Which, where, where, which one do you want me to talk, well, talk about? The, 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 well, there are two in one, actually. I mean, what is the future of food? food? And at the same time, uh, how do you manage the inflation and increasing food prices? Uh, perfect. So I think the future of food... God, that's a, such a huge question, right? And and take depends it, on the take your time. It depends on the context, in my opinion. Uh, why don't we talk about the future of Asian food, right? Because maybe it's more uh, relevant to this conversation to us, to the viewers, to our fans, to our friends. Um, you know, Asian food is not going to stop. Uh, I think the America and Europe will still discover food that has not had its glory days yet. Singaporean food is delicious and still not in the mainstream of American awareness, right? I feel like, uh, you know, the, uh, micro and food, it will become more micro regional because of people like Anthony Bourdain and Andrew Zimmern that take the world traveling every week, that increases awareness of regions that were previously unaware, like people didn't know of. So I think the food, uh, uh, America's awareness of Asian will increase the popularity of Asian food will increase and people will start to evolve more quickly. You know, in, in middle America, they still know chow mein. They still don't know pad thai. They still don't know laksa. But I think that evolution curve will will become faster. So uh, we will dot, we will still, we will actually, I think we'll have more market um, share in, Asian food will have more market share in America. In terms of the economics of food, well, wow, that's hard. I mean, that that also ties to, you know, back to GMOs, back to how we are going to produce food. But if you had a wholly organic restaurant um, that was all non-GMO, it would cost a fortune and no one could eat there. So so that 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 that's a little tough question. Uh, let me think about that. Maybe we'll come back to that one in terms of the economics of food costs, et cetera. Too, too, too brainy for me. This kid, this I'm a I'm an East L.A. almost. <laughs> Too smart for me. Oh come on! No, have, you, you're smarter than I than, than I can ever handle. Uh, have you have you ever considered distributing your cookbooks uh, uh, as well as your cooking shows on DVD format in the near future? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've been resistant to do a cookbook uh, until 
you know, maybe this year or next year because cookbooks have gotten lost in a lot of noise. There's so many books now that, that you know, but publishers only want to give books to people that have guaranteed outlets. So I think we're very close. We're getting very close to doing a cookbook. And um, the DVDs, uh, I think I'd, I'd, we'd like, we're trying to go down that path with our, um, with our production company, with, you know, so look for that hopefully in the next 12 to 18 months. Um, it might happen faster. Oh, that would be nice. Now, what's next for you? I mean, do you see yourself expanding uh, into Asia in the near future? Well, I would love to expand into Asia. <clears throat> I would have to find the right strategic partners um, because, again, you know, it's a long flight, <laughs> and I'd like, and I believe in building great teams. So, um, I think Latin America is definitely on the map for the next two years because it's closer, the logistics are easier, and I don't really know my voice in Asia. Maybe your viewers and you could tell me how relevant an Asian American kid is in Asia, right? Um, so <clears throat> I would love to have a presence in Asia. I just don't haven't figured out the right the right means yet. Oh, so you're planning to to see yourself in Latin America, as you said, Mexico, Central America, because I actually opened a uh, a, re a Thai restaurant with a friend in El Salvador about seven years ago. Um, hugely successful. Asian food is immensely popular in Latin America. So um, that I have my midterm goals set on Mexico right now in maybe 2014. But what's next for me? I have two concepts opening this year. I can give you a little hint on what they are. But uh, one is more of a dessert concept, something fun and Asian influenced. And the other is more of a, a large scale. Uh, the other one is a little more secret. It's a bigger... A uh, restaurant, fast casual concept, but um, yeah, t we've got two things happening in 2013. Now, do you actually do your own uh, R and D for desserts? As yeah, ingredients. Yeah. You, if if I took you into my garage, uh, I have giant commercial freezers and a big uh, commercial refrigerator. I believe in doing all all my R and D, and I believe in writing the formulas down perfectly to the gram. So uh, the only way a good chef or can, can be successful on a large scale is to control his R&D. So well, I write my own manuals to all my concepts. I test them. I train them myself. I believe that that is key to consistency and success. What's your, what's your favorite uh, Asian dessert? Wow. I like, I think you call it in Singapore, kaya. Huh? In uh, Thai, we call it sangkaya, but I think in Singapore you call it kaya. Uh, I have to say that and fresh coconut ice cream, like the real one with no dairy, all coconut with all the little pieces of nuts and corn in there. All day long, I could eat that. <laughs> That's why I'm such a big guy. Now, what would be your three key advice for young chefs who wants to succeed uh, in life? Yeah, this one I can handle. This one is not too brainy for me. Uh, <laughs> and. and Trust me, chefs, listen to this. Young, budding chefs, attach yourself to the best mentors you can. Because if you learn from mediocrity, you will be mediocrity, right? That means you have to set your expectations to the absolute highest possible, right? So attach yourself to great companies. Mentor, work for the best. That's the first advice. Second advice is always be humble. We have a generation of young people now that are very entitled, that are very have very poor work ethic. So um, sweep the floor and clean the kitchen for three to five years of your life after every service and you will remember where you came from. So be humble, never think you know everything. And that moment you wanna talk back to your chef or your mentor, shut up and listen, because you might learn something. And uh, number three is, um, is almost like number one. Like I tell everybody in my company, yeah? uh, this is the jet, all, people that work with me, they, they get tired of hearing this. Do one thing like you do everything, right? Be the best. So if I am drinking this cup of coffee, I'm going to drink it the best way I possibly can. If I'm going to give an interview, if I'm going to brew a cup of if I'm going to make rice, I'm going to be, I'm going to take the time to do it right. If I'm going to do something, so that conditions the body, that conditions the mind. So 
do one thing like you do everything. You can't be lazy in one thing and great in another. It doesn't work because you're trying to, you're conditioning your body. So, God, that sounded so boring and inspirational. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no worries. Now, what's your philosophy of, of, of food? <sighs> My philosophy of food, I think I'm equally a businessman that I am a, a chef. So my personal philosophy, and this is not, I'm not speaking for anybody else. My personal philosophy of food is, you know, serve your guests. Don't create food for yourself. I hate that when chefs say, well, I don't eat that, so I'm not going to cook that. That is the best way to become, to, to stay a poor chef your whole life. Understand your client, your guest, as we say, and make them happy. That is my philosophy of food. Because... That equates to satisfied customers, and that equates to dollars, and that equates to uh, repeat guests. That's my philosophy. Most people say, I'm going to do it my way and forget everybody. Well, let's see where you are in, in three to five years. And also, this is a marathon. It's not a race. The young chefs, they hit hard at 29, 30, and in a year, 18 months later, you don't know who they are anymore. I'm big on Top Chef. I, I did this, and two years later, you're done. I've been doing this for 20 years. Remember, it's a long, long marathon. That's my, those are my philosophies. To come back to the question of inflation, let me, let me rephrase that question one more time so that you know, it'll be easier to munch on. Suppose you are running, right now, you are running a, a, one of the best restaurants in America, but somehow, one way or another, uh, food prices keep on going up. Uh, so your suppliers will come to you and say, hey, Jack, you know, we have to increase the chicken price to about $2 and, and you object to it. Would you have a plan B uh, to, to get uh, alternative sources of supply? You bet. You bet. As a chef, you have to understand the board, what's moving on the board. First, you have alternate, alternate suppliers. Right, that's your first. Second, you have alternate, um, alternate, you know, ingredient options, uh, because the last thing you want to do is increase pricing, but you always you don't have a choice sometimes. So um, this is all about great menu engineering and understanding cost control. So a really great chef, not a cook, a cook makes food. A chef runs a company, runs a kitchen. So a chef really has to understand. Uh, cost controls and efficiency. So first are you as fish first are you efficient as possible? Is there anywhere else we can cut? Second, can you look at the menu and some things you're making, you know, 20%, some things you're making 10, does it all average out? Right? This is a, a really great B school like a uh, a cooking B school question, but um, I would I would I would examine all that because we do this every day, before I make a decision on do we change the ingredient, do we increase the price, or do we find an alternate source? But you have to take all that into account before you make a decision. What's your criteria in, in ensuring uh, and creating great concepts and pushing yourself beyond your, your, the boundaries? What is your three key criteria that you set yourself? Well, I don't know if there's three. I'll keep talking. Maybe we'll find three. Maybe we'll be lucky. But um, number one is understanding the market. That is an absolute um, necessity. You have to understand the demand. Analyze the demand. That's the first thing, right? Is there enough demand to sustain the business? Okay. Uh, number two is can you find profitability, right? Most people, oh, I want to open this restaurant. It's going to be so great. But they don't analyze the market and they don't analyze if there's going to be profit. Right. That's why most restaurants close. I think 60 to 70 percent of American restaurants close. Um, and then the third is, you know, look at it from the guest perspective. Everything, every decision you make is the sign on the wall. Right. Is the design right? Is the menu correct? Experience it from the guest perspective. I make all my teams go through our concepts as the guest. Take off your manager hat, take off your employee hat, come through the line like a normal person, wait in line, experience it, okay? And I'm going to give you a fourth. Um, write a very accurate sequence of service. That is key. You know, I, I, I really believe that 
Robin, when you go to a restaurant, what is the first thing that you experience when you walk into the restaurant? What is the first thing? When you walk in, it's a trick question. Oh, well, if I, if I, if I ever walk in, I will look at how clean the restaurant is, I think. It'll actually be before that. Who's going to meet me in the restaurant? That is. Before that. That's second. Very good. That before that. Huh. Let me when see. you go to the restaurant, you see the door and you see the walkway up to the hostess. Oh, yes. That's right? right? Yeah. I call that the entrance statement. What is that going to prepare the guest for? Right? Is it clean? Is it beautiful? Is there some decor that will set the experience? Does it put you at ease? Does it smell good? The second thing you experience is the, and then this can be fine dining. At Wazuzu, that's a, walking up the hill with beautiful adornments. At my fast casual restaurant, it's the decor and you walk to see the first person. And then no matter if it's fine dining or quick, fast casual, you will be greeted by somebody, right? And in either one, my rule is you must greet my guests in three seconds. Good afternoon, Robin, or good afternoon, sir. Welcome to Name of Concept. How can we help you today? That's your greeting. So entrance statement, greeting. And believe it or not, depending on the restaurant, there's 100 sequences or there's 20 sequences. I believe in consistent service and consistent food. So there's a little tips and little tricks there. <laughs> well, thank you so much. By the way, before we go, what's your dog's name? I saw that dog has been you know, moving around the kitchen. And... Oh, yeah, Rogue. Where are you, Rogue? You want to uh. say hi to Oh, okay. Oh, Rogue. Come so, here, honey. So how many dogs do you have? I have two dogs. Up. Oh, wow. Two dogs. Come here. Up. Rogue, up here. Up. All right, here's Rogue. Ah. Hi, Rogue. Oh. Hello there. Welcome and to then, the show. I know. Rogue's on the show, and Molly wants to be on the show. She's here, too. I'll pick her up and grab her. And this is Molly. Hey, hey hi. Molly. Welcome to my show. Say hey, you're on you're on TV in Singapore, guys. You're famous dogs now. Yeah. So <laughs> Rogue are our dogs. Well, great. And folks, please do visit the Jack Tila's, the Charleston's. And if not, you can always uh, order his uh, special signature uh, dishes uh, called from the Sean. And uh, once again, uh, and of course, if you are in town this weekend, you might get an autograph uh, from Mr. Zimmer and Jack Tila himself. You never know. And uh, Jack, thank you for joining me here at the National Quiz Choice, the Steinberg Review, and we look forward uh, to have you again soon in the coming days. You're the best, Robin. Continue the amazing work. And if anyone needs to get in touch with me, just go to my Facebook page or my Twitter, and we'll directly, we'll correspond directly. You're awesome. Thanks, Robin. Thanks for having me on the show. You're welcome, Jess. You're welcome.